Hi, how's everyone doing? Some great talks today. Um, it's special to be here in Jerusalem. Thank you for having me. Today I'm going to be talking about um, a really common pain point for many data scientists about how to encode categorical variables. So I hope you find some of this useful in some of your own work. I'm going to introduce the problem and some common techniques to deal with categorical variables. And then I'm going to propose a new methodology. We're going to go into some experimental results and an application that we did at WeWork with lead scoring. And that should leave us some time for questions at the end. And I'll link to a more detailed paper and some code that's available on GitHub. So one of the key challenges across many domains that data scientists face is how to encode categorical features into meaningful numerical input for machine learning algorithms. These are features such as weather, industry, location, what profession somebody's in. They're non-continuous, typically non-numerical, and have no intrinsic order. So in practice, many of these variables have extremely high cardinality. Why does this occur? Well, let's take an example of location, which is a common variable at WeWork. Uh, there's just a vast a number of possibilities. So WeWork, for example, operates in over 100 cities, and we have members and potential new members that are glo uh, located globally. There's also different morphological representations for the exact same entity. So I'm from New York, there's New York City, NYC, Manhattan, and I've noticed that here in Jerusalem there's about three names for just about everything. Uh, and then finally, if you have form input, which is really common, you can run into a lot of user error to add to the problem. But what's the issue for machine learning and analytics in particular? Well, one is that uh, computing the statistics for each of these unique values requires an intense amount of computational resources. There's basically this whole area of uh, research around MapReduce, particularly for this problem. We also need to be able to handle rare and unseen categories, because oftentimes in real life we're training on certain data that we haven't seen yet in the real world. And then finally there's I this idea of the curse of dimensionality. So the curse of dimensionality sounds spooky. What it really means is that as the number of features or dimensions grows, the amount of data that we need to generalize and to model accurately grows exponentially. So I listed some interesting mathematical phenomena. Um, some of you are probably familiar with the birthday problem, which is a um, traditional probabilistic paradox about if there's only two people, it might seem rare to have the same birthday. But at a group of 20, it's a 50-50 shot. And at a group of 70, it's almost certain. Um, but for statistics, what's really important is this idea of uh, as dimensions are increasing, the space and complexity is increasing dramatically. And then statistical significance of our values is decreasing. So we can have real issues with accuracy. How do we uh, handle categorical variables currently? Well, the most common way that I'm sure most of you are familiar with is to one-hot or dummy encode our variables. And this works by creating a new column for each unique value. And these will be binary columns. One, if that row corresponds to this value, zero otherwise. So for example, if you're encoding days of the week, you have seven new columns. It's great, it's easy, simple to code up, and our machine learning algorithms have good interpretation properties. Uh, however, at scale, this fails miserably. It, uh, it basically encounters every problem that I just listed previously. So you have a couple other uh, encoding techniques, but I highlighted target encoding. This was published in 2014 and has become extremely popular in the data science um, competition community, like Kaggle, for instance. Uh, what you're doing here is for a particular column, for each unique value, you encode that value with the mean of its response variable. So if it's 50% likely to uh, be successful, you encode it with a 0.5. Oftentimes in practice, we pull this with a prior or we apply some Gaussian noise during training. The next one uh, that I want to point out is similarity encoding, which was uh, published just last year. And it's extremely interesting. It's a generalization of one-hot encoding, whereby instead of uh, 
binary columns for each unique value, we're gonna replace that with similarity metrics across the unique values. So you'd use things like Levenstein ratios. Um, and so for the encoding, you have the same problem with dimensionality, but you get uh, this basically free generalization to rare and unseen categories. And then you can adequately apply dimensionality reduction techniques like principal component analysis. And then finally, I listed neural network embeddings up here. Uh, this is very popular. I'm personally a big fan of clever uses of word to vec. I've seen like product to vec, cat to vec, all these sorts of things. However, in uh, industry, if you're trying to rapidly prototype and ship models, the R&D cost can be a little bit prohibitive here. So what am I proposing today? Basically what I'm saying is that we should lean on uh, statistical literature in conjugate Bayesian modeling. I'll introduce some notation here. First we have X, which is going to be our categorical feature matrix, our inputs, which is N rows by M columns. And then we're gonna have a target variable matrix that we're trying to predict, N rows. And then we have the conjugate Bayesian model itself, which is defined as follows. We have a prior distribution of some parameter theta. Then we have a likelihood function of our target variable y according to that parameter theta. And then the posterior distribution, which is defined by Bayes' theorem, which says that the posterior distribution is the product of the prior and the likelihood divided by the probability of our data. So why are we using conjugate Bayesian models? Well, two things. One is that Bayes' theorem will be analytically tractable, which is really nice because we don't have to deal with this uh, messy numerical integration here. And then the second thing is that conjugate Bayesian models fit really nicely to very common machine learning problems. So here are some examples. You have binary classification, for example, which is modeled by the simple beta binomial. You have multi-class classification, where we can use a Dirichlet prior and a multinomial likelihood. And you have regression, which can be normal, uh, modeled with a normal inverse Gaussian prior and a Gaussian likelihood. And so if you have a different problem, typically what you wanna do is look at the likelihood that fits your problem and then find its conjugate pair. Um, if you have one in mind, I'd be very interested in hearing about it because I think this technique would be great to expand upon. Here's the actual algorithm. It looks dense, but it's really quite straightforward. So again, you have your inputs, basically your categorical feature matrix X and your target variable Y, and you wanna get out of it an encoded matrix Z. So what you do first is to initialize your prior distributions. And uh, from the last slide, it's problem specific. So if we're doing binary classification, we would choose a beta prior and we have to initialize the parameters, alpha and beta, for a beta distribution. Then we simply loop through the columns. And for each column, we're gonna initialize a set of the unique values. For that unique value, we're gonna compute the posterior distribution with its corresponding target variables, and then we're gonna compute our chosen Q moments to build our encoder. So why chosen Q moments? You might choose to only encode with the mean or also the mean invariance if you have enough data to give maybe a tree-based learner an additional split. So the encoder is really this function here of column and value. To actually encode a matrix, you wanna return Z. It's very simple. You're just looping through that column and all the rows and applying the function of column and value, then setting your corresponding indices adequately through the function. So that was a little dense maybe, but we can walk through a simple example, uh, binary classification. So here's a data set. Uh, y is our target variable, where a zero is a failure, a one is a success, and we just have one simple column here, lead source, with two values, web and event. The first step, again, is choosing a conjugate Bayesian model and assigning priors. So, because it's binary classification, we're gonna go with the beta binomial, which can be modeled with k successes from our data and some prior success parameter alpha, and n minus k failures from our data plus some prior uh, failure parameter beta. Alpha and beta themselves need to be assigned, so we're going to say uh, uninformative Jeffries prior to start, which is 0.5 for alpha and 0.5 for beta. 
And then the next step is to loop through those columns and values and compute the uh, posterior. So for this data set, web has two successes, one failure, event, one and one. And uh, the posterior distributions look as follows. For web, we end up with a beta 2.5, 1.5, and for event, 1.5, 1.5. So fairly straightforward. For any value that we haven't seen yet, it simply gets the prior. Finally, we calculate the moments, which is really the encoding that we save. So for these lead sources, uh, web would be encoded with the mean and variance 0.625 and 0.047 respectfully, and event similarly. And then again, any lead source that we haven't encountered yet would get the mean and variance of the prior. Um, so that's obviously a toy example. Let's get into some experimentation results and the application with the lead scoring engine at WeWork. So for experiments, we ran six on some benchmark data sets from the UCI repository, uh, two from each of the following uh, machine learning problems, binary, multi-class classification, and regression. And here's what a result set looks like. So what we're doing here is comparing the conjugate Bayesian model encoder, which in this case is a beta, across uh, very common encoders, binary, one-hot, ordinal, and target. And uh, we're measuring accuracy on 10-fold cross-validation with an error bar of one standard deviation above and below the mean. And each group here is a different learning uh, algorithm sitting on top of the encoder. So you have gradient boosting, logistic regression, a simple neural network, and random forest. And everything here is just using um, out-of-the-box scikit-learn, so it's keeping everything fair. And basically what we wanted to see here on these simple UCI repositories is that conjugate Bayesian models are performing at least as well as the base encoders. Um, so here in adult, uh, particularly with uh, the gradient boosting and the random forest, which are tree-based classifiers, it's performing quite well. So multi-class, here are the results. Um, CAR probably is some more variance, but again, for gradient boosting, performing at least as well, if not better than everything. And uh, nursery, again, sort of at the top there. And for regression, insurance is somewhat similar across all encoders. Bike sharing, we're doing quite well with random forest. Um, but these UCI repositories are quite clean, so it's not exactly the use case that we uh, are really testing in production. So we'll get into the application at WeWork that we use this for. What is lead scoring? Well, we had this problem where our marketing funnel didn't have a strong mechanism to understand lead quality and to respond with the appropriate tactics. For instance, we didn't have a way to prioritize for our outbound sales team, which we called new member development, or NMD. We didn't have a way to automatically route leads, for instance, of certain qualities to NMD, certain qualities to a drip campaign. And then we didn't have a way for marketing to attribute success. Um, we didn't have a strong delineation between what's a good lead, what's been marketing qualified, sales qualified, et cetera. So we propose lead scoring as a solution to these. It basically enables the sales prioritization that we are looking for for our outbound sales team. It enables intelligent lead routing by making uh, business decisions on certain thresholds to split off the lead. Uh, it also allows marketing ROI because we can measure campaigns based on the quality of leads that they've attracted. And then finally, it also enables sales forecasting because it finally gave us insight into the upper funnel, which we were lacking previously. Of course, what did we encounter? The first thing was basically that a lot of these variables, industry and location, for example, were extremely high dimensional. I think industry was about 30,000 unique categories, and location was about 20,000. So we needed a way to encode these into digestible inputs. You can't just throw them straight into a machine learning algorithm. The first thing that we tried was actually what's called a one-hot encoder with a truncation, which is a super simple idea. What you do is any unique value that doesn't hit a certain count, you group into other. So if a unique value doesn't hit 100, for instance, it gets grouped together with everything that didn't hit 100. 
The other thing that we tried was conjugate Bayesian model encoding, and here are the results. So the first model um, actually had surprisingly good accuracy, 92.4%, but the precision and recall was weak. And that's because it's losing so much of the detail in the tail end of those um, lead sources and industries and locations. Uh, with conjugate Bayesian model, we saw definitely an increase in accuracy, but a remarkable increase in precision and recall. Uh, the ROC curve, for instance, is much better, a lot steeper, smoother, bigger area. So from a business perspective, of course, we had higher accuracy measures, but also we're now able to have full coverage of our leads. We're scoring them on the most minute detail, whereas before we were grouping them into this bucket. We're also extendable to new data, because as these new lead sources and industries and locations get discovered, we would before be grouping them again into other, but now we can first model them with a prior, and then every time we retrain the model, even if it didn't hit a threshold of a certain count, we're updating the distributions. Um, so this is a really nice part of the project. The other thing that's really cool is that beta distributions themselves are interesting. So we can gain a lot of insight, for instance, into how well is a lead source performing. You'll have inbound calls uh, and uh, obviously form input that are performing extremely well. We can look at locations and their beta distributions over time. How are they converting leads? And we can even set up thresholds just based on the beta distributions themselves. So if the beta distribution has an extremely low variance and a really high mean, then that's a good lead source, for instance. So we might just, we might just go ahead and send that straight to our outbound call center. Whereas the other ones that we're less sure of, we might wait for the final learner to score it and then go ahead and send it to the outbound call center. So then this uh, slide sort of summarizes our findings with this encoding. What we did here was compare conjugate Bayesian encoding with vanilla one-hot encoding as we step through the sample sizes of our lead scoring data set. At the top, we have sample size versus training time. And I had to divide one-hot encoding by 100 to keep the uh, two models comparable on the same graph. But what you can see is by just 50,000 samples, the one-hot training time is exploding. We're up to about seven minutes of training time, whereas conjugate Bayesian model encoding, we're training in about 1.6 seconds. Um, what's happening here is that as we're seeing more and more data, the dimensionality is exploding for one-hot encoding. And the model's getting more complex. It's requiring more computational resources. It's a harder problem to solve, in essence. For conjugate Bayesian encoding, the dimensionality is staying constant. So we're, yes, we're seeing more rows, but the dimensions are only staying one or two if you're using variance. And then on the bottom, we have sample size versus accuracy, which is really interesting. What's happening with one-hot encoding is that it starts off fairly accurate, but as the dimensionality is increasing, it's encountering all the issues with the curse of dimensionality that we talked about earlier. So the dimensionality is growing and our statistical significance is weakening and the complexity of the models is getting higher and higher and we're overfitting a little bit. And so it's gonna decrease throughout time. On the other hand, conjugate Bayesian encoding is doing a lot better. Well, what's going on there is that the beta distributions themselves are getting more certain and we're seeing more values so we can accurately model them. But also the learner that sits on top of the encoding is not seeing more dimensions, it's just seeing more rows. Um, so that's like kind of exactly what you want in machine learning. The more data you see, the better the model's gonna perform, especially if dimensionality is remaining constant. Um, so that basically wraps up the talk. I think we have some time if you guys have any questions, but I also post a link to the more detailed paper on archive and some code that's available on GitHub. So thank you guys. <laughs>